In the early medieval period, so about 500 to about 900, there were two types of sites which had fortifications, defensible sites and defended sites. But although ditches and walls were often designed for defense, just because a site had a ditch or a wall doesn't necessarily mean that it was a site designed for fortification. Oftentimes in this period, the presence of these structures marked out borders for estates or functioned as means of social control. The walls of Merovingian villas, as Guy Halsell points out in his book, Warfare and Society in the Barbarian West, served as a marker beyond which slaves would be considered runaways, and ditches around villages which had relations with Merovingian kings served to mark the boundary where royal law was more stringently enforced. That being said, any wall or ditch could be converted into a defensive structure if the situation called for it. The most basic unit of societal organization, the rural village, doesn't appear to have been fortified, no matter where you look, in the post-Roman West during the early Middle Ages. In late antiquity, aristocratic villas were not fortified, and although we have the writings of one of those aristocrats, Sidonius Apollinaris, stating that one villa did have walls and towers, that is still only one example, and Gregory of Tours doesn't make mention of defended villas very often in his History of the Franks from the 500s. Seats of power don't appear to have been fortified either in the manner in which we typically understand the term. The Carolingian capital of Aachen, for example, did not have extensive defensive works, nor did the Northumbrian capital of Everin. There were walls and hedges which made the site defensible in theory, but the actual palace lay outside of those walls. Many towns in the late antique period were actually fortified, especially during the late 3rd and the early 4th centuries, and these walls generally appear to have been made of stone. These are not easy to date, however, and although there is an argument that they were constructed rapidly as a response to barbarian raids, it's also possible they were constructed over the course of the century. In any case, many of these walls were ransacked for the stone and allowed to fall into disrepair, although it doesn't appear to be due to lack of trying to maintain them, and by the early Carolingian period many had entered serious states of structural decline. What did exist, however, especially by the 700s, were the timbered halls made famous through pop culture media like The Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, and The Elder Scrolls. These appear to have been something like local centers of power where a leader and his war band resided, and where the warriors were taken care of in exchange for military service. Sometimes these halls had palisades or rudimentary walls, and it potentially could take a great deal of effort to break through the double sets of doors if they were defended by warriors with spears, and unless the attackers had heavy axes, taking down the walls may potentially have been more trouble than it was worth. The thatch could always be ignited, but if it was kept damp, then that wasn't necessarily an option. In any case, taking the hall doesn't always appear to have been the main objective. Instead, many early medieval sources make it clear that the defenders were to be penned inside, while the rest of the attackers made off with the animals, crops, and potentially the peasants who lived nearby. The archaeology of this period reveals that many Roman urban sites were abandoned, and although the abandonment wasn't complete, cities often became ghosts of their former selves. Cities functioned as administrative centers and economic nodes, but the cities shrank in size. In Metz, for example, the key building appears to have been a Roman amphitheater that was fortified, much in the same way that in early medieval Rome, people moved into the Colosseum. New villages sprang up on hillsides, bathhouses were converted into strongholds, etc., but perhaps the two most salient features of the immediate post-Roman West were the development of trading centers, usually unfortified at the mouths of rivers, and the rise of what's known as numinous protection. The saints had power beyond understanding in this period, so the tombs of those saints, such as Martin of Tours, saw towns either contract around them, or saw people leaving Roman towns and cities to establish themselves in their vicinity, and armies would dare to violate the sacred space of the saint at their own mortal peril. Almost all of these places were nearby older Roman fortifications or newly fortified zones, but they were separate from the main spiritual and economic space. And yet, the early medieval period was violent. There were no armies on modern scales, of course, but small war bands and potentially armies numbering in the low thousands were often recorded, so why was there little to no preoccupation with defensive works? The answer appears to lie in the nature of warfare of the early Middle Ages, especially in the 7th and the 8th centuries. Towns and cities were never very populous in this period, and when they were laid siege to, more often than not they were taken through a turncloak aiding the besiegers. We have no known instances, for example, 
of these places being taken by outright assault for the Merovingian period. Early medieval war was often ritualized. Direct slaughter wasn't always the aim. Instead, it was reinforcing social ties and ideas about societal hierarchies, and the taking of plunder, and the ritual exchange of military gifts such as armor and weapons from a commander to his troops. This is not to say, of course, that the residents of a city or a town were spared or treated nicely, far from it. The people of early medieval Vienne, for example, were infamously massacred in 501 during the Burgundian Civil War, and the longer the siege, the more brutal the attacks on civilians. But, as a general rule, for the post-Roman West, fortification and thus lengthy sieges appear to have been rare. What changes this are the Norse raids, which begin in the late 700s, and with the dawn of the Viking era, Europe undergoes a military transformation, leading to a new form of warfare and new methods of siegecraft to carry out assaults on the castles, which began popping up all over Western Europe. And with that, we'll close this video and examine the Viking Age and the changes to warfare which occurred during it in the next part.